and welcome once again to the Knights Templar Church and I'm Reverend Steve Chris Cole. And today's sermon is taken from the letter to the Galatians and we are looking at chapter 2 and we're going to begin at verse 11 and the title for today's sermon is called Upholding Gospel Truth. So before we begin let us just have a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we Lord we thank you for your presence among us. Lord we know that you are our uh, steadfast supporter and helper Lord and we are your servants Lord so Father God we thank you for this relationship Lord which is so vast and so huge uh, that we could never possibly put it into words but Lord we are your children and we thank you Lord for your help to us through the Holy Spirit helping us to uh, understand your word and understand the truth of your gospel so Lord we ask you to bless us and bless this time together in Jesus precious name Right, so let's get started then. So today we are looking at, as I said, Galatians. And let's just read, and it's only um, just a, uh, four verses really. Uh, let's, so let's read those. It begins as follows. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come... He withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the, the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So says God's word. Short reading today, uh, but it's got, uh, it's got quite an impact. Now, let me just ask a question. Uh, you can answer it for yourself, I guess. Do you ha happen to know one of the biggest problems that faces Christians today? Hmm? You might have, you'll have your own answer, I guess. Um, I could come up with a couple. One could be maybe persecution. Um, some other people might say, well, it's about the, the dwindling numbers of uh, people in going to church. And they're both valid. And, that this, you know, there certainly are problems, that's for sure. But the one I want to concentrate on today is this. A big problem is the misinterpretation of Scripture. This is nothing new, by the way. Okay, but it is still even though we have the Bible translated into our own languages, it's still a problem. See, the thing is, with misinterpretation of, um, of Scripture, is that it, it goes much further, because it prompts and brings about, uh, and it feeds behaviour, the things that people do. So that's when we start to see this, the formation of activities like, well, you know, splits in churches and things like that, and different affiliations, that sort of thing. See, my experience tells me that men and women in this world, they've got their own agendas. And I think you just need to look around the world today to see that there are a bunch of those knocking about. Now, people tend to keep their agendas to themselves, especially if they're ones which are... Well, let's just say that they want to control other people, for example. They keep that one under their hat. They go about performing behaviours that might sort of well, that might seem good on the surface, uh, but actually they have an underlying motive and agenda. Now, the uh, as Christians, the only true um, uh, agenda that we should have as a believer is to glorify God. Now, we can do that in many ways. I mean, you know, there's, there's far too many to mention here. But that's it, to glorify God. So I've got a couple of questions that I want to, I want to pose for today's sermon. Um, first one is, how do we determine those things that glorify God and those which don't? That's an interesting question, isn't it? How do we know? I have another related question. Let's try this one. Where or from whom do we get our Christian instruction? 
I'll leave those with you for now, and we'll see if we get those some answers popping up later on. So let's turn to our scripture, and, and see if it kind of sheds some light on the subject, shall we? Uh, well, we can see right from the very beginning of that, uh, verse 1, that Apostle Paul had a problem with something that Peter did. And, and so what did Paul do about that? I think that's fairly obvious too, isn't it? He said, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. There you are. So you could say in more sort of modern parlance, you could say, well, he called him out. But before we get to that, let's find out what Peter did that caused Paul to have such a, well, shall we say an abrupt reaction. So let's get the story straight. Paul had been in Antioch, uh, he'd been there for some considerable time, and then at some point later, P later Peter joined them, and we're not sure how long he'd been there, um, but at least long enough for Peter to have, um, you know, had some social activities with everybody around, and, uh, and don't forget that the people who were there were both uh, Jewish and mostly Gentile uh, converts. So Peter was eating with them, and he was uh, worshipping with them, I guess, doing all the things that you do in your normal daily life. Uh, and um, now, the thing is, if they had been following the old Jewish traditions, what Peter was doing by sitting down, well, any, any Jew, ex-Jew, anyway, if they sat down with the Gentiles, this was, this was uh, to be, it was banned, basically. You just didn't do it. It was forbidden. So let's go back to, uh, we're speaking about Peter, aren't we? So let's just quickly go back to something that Peter had said previously, which was uh, said publicly. Um, and so it was recorded and written down. In this, in this case, it was written by Luke. Uh, and he wrote it in the book of Acts, chapter 15. So, so let's read that. I want to remind ourselves what Peter had said in the past. Okay. And it reads, this is uh, Acts 15, verse 7. Following. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by the mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did to us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now before Therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. And of course, they are the Gentiles, aren't they? So years earlier, when challenged, and it was the Pharisees that were challenging him, mostly, in Jerusalem, that this was Peter's reply. And he basically saying, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. If you're a Christian, those things do not apply. Hmm? So that's what Peter said. Now let's also remind ourselves of something else about Peter. Because if you remember, he had a dream. It was, it was even before this speech. He had a dream. And it was specifically about his own unwillingness to, to eat with the Gentiles. This issue that we're talking about in, in Galatians today. Uh, because, like I said, it was a taboo activity. Let's just remind ourselves and, and read what happened to Peter. We'll not read everything, but we'll just read a, a, a small part. So, Acts 11 this time. So, we've gone back in time a little. Acts 11, verse 5, following. And it reads, I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend, as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Arise, Peter slay and eat but i said not so lord for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth 
But when the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. So it was after that that, Paul, that Peter, uh, he, he did the, the vision that God showed him and he repented of his behaviour and he laid aside those old habits and the tradition of the Jews and he ate with the Gentiles. Now, let's come back to our story in Galatians. So that's two things that we've seen about Peter, isn't it? Well, what we notice from our scripture is that some men arrived it says from James, okay? Now, it says presumably sent by James, but we'll see in a moment that the, the, James probably did not send these men. It's simply that they probably came from Jerusalem. They may well have been, I'm guessing, they may well have been part of the greater council of Jerusalem, of which James was the head. So Paul may just be saying, well, he came from James, but that's not that James actually sent them. So let's find out a bit more. Uh, there is some issue with these men. Let's just look at what it is. In Galatians 2.12 it says, For before that, before these men came, before that certain came from James, those men, yes, he did eat, meaning Peter, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Who is of the circumcision? Obviously. Well, it's not his present company because he'd been sat down eating with them for ages. It certainly isn't Paul, that's for sure. So it has to be, he's referring to these men that came from, we'll assume, Jerusalem. Or from James, as it says. These were the men of the circumcision. So what does that mean? It means that once again, once again, it seems that false teachers were being sent to uh, disrupt the believers, to spread their bile. And what was their bile? Well, their bile was the fact that they wanted to insist that if you were to be a Christian, then you had to follow the, the law, the law being the law of the Pharisees, the law which said that you must be circumcised. Yes, well, I don't think that's going to go down very well, do you? <laughs> but what were they doing there? Why did they come? And so what were they trying? We know from past experience when we've looked at this before, that, that men had been sent, and we know that men had been sent specifically by the Pharisees because we're told that, not in this passage, but in other passages, we're told Pharisees sent these men, and what did they do? They tried their best to insist on these laws being introduced. If you want to be saved, you've got to follow the laws. Yes, you can believe in Jesus, but to be properly saved, you've got to believe in the laws. So. You know, we know that James in, in Jerusalem, we know that he was a true believer. I mean, they, they, we'd had this business before where, you know, where, do you remember where Paul had, had travelled all the way? Um, I forget where he came from now, but uh, he was travelling all a long, long way back to Jerusalem just to compare his doctrine with the doctrine that James was doing because of the same kind of issue, the same issue. Someone had come from Jerusalem and would, was giving... Uh, Paul's people a hard time. Now they were doing it again. So these men, they obviously started to influence the, the community in Antioch, where Peter and Paul were. So as a result, what we see is this reaction from Peter, this very strange reaction. What it seems has happened is that an, the old behaviour of Peter, it had just popped out. Instead of standing strong in his faith, he began to buckle under the watchful eyes of these pious teachers. Now it says in verse, verse 12, which we read a moment ago, it says that he withdrew. Now, that's a good word to use, but I want to give an extra flavour to that word, because when you look at the word 
in the con in the way that the Hebrews view this word. The full meaning is that it was well. It, it can be translated as withhold under. It doesn't really help us very much, I suppose. But what what it means is a, a kind of gradual moving away. Now, so we can put that into slightly more, uh, more modern English, and we could say that Peter decided started to shrink away, which kind of that, that hopefully that gives you a, a better flavour of that word. It's not just withdrew. Withdrew could mean, well, I turned around and walked out the room, which is fairly abrupt, isn't it? No, withdrew. In this sense, it meant that he gradually moved away and stopped eating with the Gentiles. Why was that? Was it, was it fear, do you think? And if it was fear, what, what was he afraid of? Maybe... Maybe he was just afraid of what these men, these men, would think of him. See, this fear had obviously overcome him, just, just as it had done in the past, in slightly different ways. And it's, my, it's, it's sort of like what you might call, it's like uh, the old dog, which had come back to gnaw at his ankle. Hmm? So what was his answer? Well, his answer was to revert back to... To his old religion. It's just like he flipped. Maybe, yeah, maybe we can guess. He didn't want to offend the other guests, the other people there, the, the guests that have come from Jerusalem. He didn't want to offend them, maybe. But, you know, whatever the reason, and we can't know that because we can't get into Peter's head. But in bowing to these, we'll call them pious people with their beliefs that they brought with them, Peter was willing to forsake all that Jesus had uh, taught him, just simply, seem seemingly, to appease these men. You might think after all this time of Peter being a, a, an apostle, you'd have thought he wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't happen. But Paul is telling this story. He said, this is what happened. See, the thing is, there is a cause and effect situation going on here. You see, there, there are, what I mean by cause and effect, there is a cause, which is a, um, an action, isn't it? Some kind of action. <clears throat> and then there are consequences for those actions. Peter was a leader. He was an apostle. He was, he was a person who lived with Jesus himself. He had a very, very high profile, didn't he? So what, what he did, the things that he did, his behaviour, that's going to reflect in the actions of other people. I mean, the nature of weak men is what? Is to, is to, is to follow, is to join in with even hypocrisy uh, and it, it's usually through ignorance and, and an often just this business of wanting to conform not wanting to be the odd one out so what do we call that today well i have a nice phrase for you and i've used this before and i'll keep using it people who do this kind of thing are virtue signalers they're following this guy and they're saying, look, we will do the same. And we, we will make sure that you see that we're doing the same. And that's what they did. But Peter was a, sp a strong spiritual leader, wasn't he? He was a strong man, wasn't he? he wasn't, he's an ex-fisherman. He, I mean, physically, I'm sure he, had, uh, he, he was quite strong. Mentally? Well, of course, he must be. Uh, he, he must have a, uh, a sense of strength mentally surely so what he did must be right then right wrong <laughs> no you see we've got to think about this as well as peter we're told that barnabas was even one of those who shrunk away with everyone else barnabas the man called the encourager not the enforcer the encourager that's what his nickname was. 
This is the man who stood by Paul and represented Paul in front of the Jerusalem Council. And, you know, this is not a shrinking violet. But he did shrink, didn't he? That also must seem quite odd. It seems odd to me, anyway, at, f on, at first glance. So he followed Peter in his sinful actions. Why on earth would he do that? Now, I can only make an educated guess because I don't know is the simple answer. But what I think is that it was probably out of loyalty to Peter. And in doing so, he followed in the wrong that Peter had done. And it also, what it means is that, you know, even strong-willed people will engage in acts that are contrary to God's word, even when they know them to be sinful. And Barnabas must have known, surely. So it would seem once again that, that Peter had sort of shown his own particular character flaw, which was, you know, that his behavior was not in line with what he said. You remember, I, I told you what he'd said earlier on. The Jews and the Gentiles are the same. That's what Peter said. Now, he's shrinking away from eating with them and going back in, into, into the old Jewish habit. Or law, if you like. Now, he's made these kind of errors quite a few times. He did it when, you know, Jesus said, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. Peter said, nah, 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 nah and guess what happened? He did. So this old floor of his, it's popped up again, hasn't it? How does this happen? Well, I'll tell you how it can happen. It's happened to me. Now, I've had an, a slightly, a somewhat different experience than, than the vast majority of people in that my training many years ago was as a psychotherapist. And one of the things that I learned as part of my own self-development, self-awareness training, I should say, personal development, if you like, is what we called it. I learned a number of my flaws, which was deftly pointed out by some other people in our groups. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, but I learned a lot from that. I learned about myself. I learned that one of the things that, well, we'll not go into what my personal defects are, but I learned a few things and I thought that one, I, yeah, those I've got to keep an eye on. So I did, I kept an eye on them and I kept refreshing. But many years have gone by since I was a therapist. I finished that job in I finished doing that in about 2007 so it's quite some time now and what I've noticed is that one or two of those old character flaws that I had in the past that I thought I'd put a lid on guess what they do they pop back up again when you're not looking and that's the that's the key it's because you're not paying attention these personality we'll call them defects shall we personality errors problems that we all have in one form or another, they can pop up again. And I think that that, well, I think the, the evidence of, of the, what we know about Peter shows us that that is what happened to Peter again. More than that, I can't say, but that's just my take on it. So you just take that, take it or leave it. So, okay, so everybody's slunk off. <laughs> You can imagine them sort of edging towards the door, kind of thing, little by little. Uh, who's left? Paul, of course. Uh, and what's his reaction? Well, I think we've, we've already gathered what his reaction is uh, from verse 11. He stood up to Peter and you could almost imagine him saying, uh, slightly irreverently, was it, uh, Oi, just a minute, before you, sleep, before you sneak off, I want a word. And you lot, <laughs> you can stay here because I want you to hear this. Yeah, that, that, I'm, I'm being a bit sort of uh, theatrical about it, but you, you get the idea. Um, we need to be aware that Peter's actions were public. Peter's actions were public. What he did was seen by everyone. All right? Now, being a leading figure, an apostle, you know, very high profile guy. So what Peter did, others would take great care to notice and think to themselves, well, what Paul, what Peter does, it must be, yeah, 
you know, we'll, we'll follow along, we'll do that. He made, a sl he made a public affair of slinking away and trying to avoid the eating with Gentiles. And what, are that, what is that, what's that message that's sent by Peter when he does that? Well, it's a, it sends a message, it infers to other people that these false teachers are correct. That we shouldn't be eating with the Gentiles. After all, he'd strayed away from his words, hadn't he? He'd strayed away from the teachings of our Lord. He was dragging other people away with him while he was doing it. Now, Paul, he was not going to let this happen. He saw the consequences of Peter's actions. And it must have immediately pricked him into action. I mean, he also realised the public nature of Paul's error. And, you know, so what did he do? He spoke up to his face, and it says in the scripture, before all, in front of everyone. It had to be tackled publicly. Because Peter had committed his error publicly. I think I've made that point fairly clear, I hope. Let's look at it again, verse 14. He says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Paul's understanding of the gospel instantly prompted him to know that Peter was not acting in accordance with as Paul has said, the truth of the gospel. Now, the truth of the gospel, what is that? Well, it's, it's what's written in, in, the, in the scriptures. But it's not just about... See, don't forget, in those days, they only had scriptures from the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. Paul was still busy writing his letters. Okay? Luke hadn't penned his pen, John and so on. All of these... So, what do they mean by the truth of the gospel? Well, what they mean is stuff that they had agreed on. Peter, Paul, Barnabas, James, when they went to the Jerusalem council, they all agreed that they were following the truth of the gospel. The things, and what that is, the truth of Jesus Christ. The things that Jesus had taught them all, or revealed to them in Paul's case. All of that. So, Paul, he publicly took Peter to task so that all concerned could hear just and recognise not only Paul, uh, Peter's error, but their error also. So he put them all, uh, you know, put them all straight in one foul swoop. That's not an easy thing to do, is it? Stand up and be against everyone. They could have turned him down. They could have shouted him down. They could have turned their backs on him. And his ministry had just followed Peter. Could have done, couldn't they? But the reality was, Paul was right. And once challenged, they knew he was right. I think that's one of the dis differences between us today and them in those days, 2,000 years ago. We've got so many different people berating us with different ideas, things that we need to, well, believe this, believe that, this is a new doctrine, this is a etc., etc., and so many things, follow this guy, follow this organisation, follow this, follow that. How do, in those days, they didn't have terribly many uh, competing ideas. Yeah, there were the Gnostics as well, of course. But the, the main thrust was coming from interference from the Pharisees, trying to, trying to infiltrate and sneak in under the back door, so to speak, uh, with their, let's bring the law back in. So that, you know, bring the law back in. So it wasn't, you know, they didn't have too many things to think about. Once the, what I'm getting at is, once the truth had been pointed out to them, they didn't have lots of, lots of arguments to fall back on. They knew some quite a, a lot. They knew they'd been taught about the truth of the gospel. They knew the truth of the gospel, just as they knew many of the scriptures from the Old Testament. And they knew as soon as Paul pointed it out to them, they went, oh, "Okay, we made a mistake." 
so uh, what are the lessons that we can learn from this? Well, Paul, he had a purpose for writing about this incident. In, in, in his letter to the Galatians, he went on uh, in the rest of the chapter to talk about how they, as followers of Christ, are justified by Christ's actions and his subsequent actions, you know, his crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension and so on. Um, but and, and that we are justified by faith, not by the works, any works, and especially not by works of the law. And that was his message through, uh, and he goes on to expand upon that. But this is kind of like the introduction to this idea that he's trying to get across. Now, that law that Peter had reverted to by not eating with the Gentiles, well, that was an example of what can happen when people just do that flip. He wanted people to see that even Peter, the apostle, can fall foul of this. So Galatians can you. So people of today can you. But you know, as, as we look at this incident with Peter and Paul, it was Paul that's talked about, well, you know, those things that he's talked about, we can relate to them today, as I've just been saying. Do you remember I asked you a question earlier on? Well, a couple of questions, actually, but one of them was um, something along the order, where, where or from whom do we get our Christian instruction? Do you remember? I mean, it can get a bit confusing. We can, you know, in the case of uh, this incident with, with Peter and Paul in Antioch, you've got Peter with his ideas, you've got Paul with his ideas, there's Barnabas there as well, and then there's these guys who, who rock up from, uh, from probably Jerusalem, uh, and then there's everybody else, and it's like, well, uh, <laughs> who's right? Each person had their own concept of what it meant to be saved. Now, we, we thought from past experiences that, that Paul and Peter, as I said, they'd, and Barnabas, that they were in agreement about what it meant to be saved. But all it took was a small contingent from whoever to, to, to pop along with some credible argument or whatever, some credible ideas, to completely turn everybody into hypocrites, except Paul, of course. Now, and I would guess that these men who were, you know, the, they, they were of the same that, that had, had come in at other times, like I said, they were sent by the Pharisees probably and to disrupt and, and, and these upstart Christians. They couldn't kill them off. They managed to kill off uh, Jesus, but they know full well that that didn't go well. <laughs> so all, what have they got left? Cause division in the ranks. Uh, get Christianity to dismantle itself from within. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we can see exactly the same thing happening in our churches and Christian communities today. As I alluded to earlier on, there's an awful lot more people, Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, uh, Joyce Mayer, and, and the list is endless of people who follow goodness knows well. I mean, in the case of Osteen, it's the prosperity gospel, Benny Hinn also, I think. Uh, they're all at it in different ways. You know, there, 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 are, there are so many who, who have doctrines that are so far indeed from the truth of the gospel, yet they are just swallowed hook, line and sinker by the gullible. When I say gullible, maybe that's about, I should say also, by the poorly informed. Poorly informed. Well, yeah, I mean, let's face it. We have this, this funny, uh, this big book here, and it's full of all that writing. Oh, my goodness, do I have to read all of that? Do I have to learn all of that? No, you don't have to learn all of that. But it's a good idea to read God's Word so that you'll know something about him, about his doctrines, about his, his own re requirements of us, the life of Christ, and blah, you know what I'm talking about. This is what we need to look at in order to be informed. 
uh, a visiting pastor or someone or a preacher comes along and gives you a message and it leaves you scratching your head thinking, yeah, I wasn't sure about that. I wasn't sure about some of that stuff. So what do you do about it? Go back to this. That's what you do. But anyway, we are not, it shows us from this story, we should not take our lead from those who come along and feed us new information. If you don't like what the preacher is saying, if you're not sure about it, get it checked out. Don't just go along with it. You know, some people's ideas might sound really credible to our ears. Well, surely these ideas, the people that, that, that tell us these ideas, surely they are not the last authority on these things. Do we do what Barnabas did and the others did with, you know, with Peter? See, Paul, what he does, he shows us exactly where we need to go in such a situation. And the answer, of course, is God's word. Everything, and yes, I mean everything, must always be weighed on the basis of, as Paul put it, the truth of the gospel. Not wavering and varying in a slight direction this way, in a slight direction. There are no waverings. There is only heresy in, that, in those directions. People, you know, a heresy is not somebody who is completely against God. A heresy is a small thing that is brought in that changes a, a part of doctrine or, or one doctrine, perhaps. They accept all of the rest of it, but this one area, that's a heresy. You do not follow people who teach heresies. I'll be absolutely honest. In re the last couple of years, I have walked out of a congregation. I've stood up and walked out whilst listening to somebody preaching heresy. And my family followed me. Yes. Do not tolerate it. You must be bold. And speaking of bold, is it, is it about courage or is it about belief in the truth of the gospel and standing up for it? We who, you see the symbol behind me, this is the battle flag of the Templars. It's a symbol of strength, of the battle against evil by good, following Christ, with Christ as our guide. We have to be able to stand strong in our beliefs. If you don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't have a strong foundation in the truth of the gospel, how on earth can you be a Templar? <laughs> how can you stand strong like Paul did? How can we bold, be bold as Christians if we don't have that firm foundation of God's truth? Paul gives us an answer in another part of another one of his writings Ephesians 6 I'll start at verse 10 it says finally my brethren finally this is the end of his statement finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And he goes on. He carries on to explain exactly what the armour of God is, if you read the rest of Ephesians 6. We should know that. When we are confronted with some idea or some doctrine that does not sit well in our minds, or maybe it just makes sense, but it's new information. Maybe you think it makes sense. 
but you're not very uh, you're not you're not very sort of in depth any in any form of study in the Bible. What do we do? Are you going to be like Barnabas? Are you going to be like Peter? Do you just accept it uh, and embrace it wholeheartedly without even questioning? Let me ask you a question. If you went to buy a second-hand car and you saw a nice red one on the, on the, on the lot out there, well, that's a lovely red car, that. Would you go directly to the salesman and say, that red car, I want to buy it. How much is it? And he says, blah, blah, blah. right, fine, there, there's the money. Great. And off you go. Would you do that? Uh, I would hope not. <laughs> I think you just might want to, what, check under the bonnet? We call it a bonnet in England. Okay, it's a hood in America, okay? Check and see if all the wires and everything connected. If Is this thing in good working order before you hand over your cash? You want to see if the, the wheels, are the wheels falling off? Are there, what, are there any problems? Look around, feel, check to see if there's any rust. And You know, if you've bought second-hand cars, and I bought quite a few, you learn. <laughs> Believe me, when you buy a clanker, <laughs> as I have done in the past, you learn very quickly. So, you know, in the same way, you wouldn't go to that car lot and say to the salesman and just take the salesman's word for it, you know? Yes, it's only done 20,000 miles and it's as clean as a whistle and it's only had one owner and blah, 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 etc, etc, etc. Do we believe everything he says or do we check the documentation? Do we go around and check the car? Do we, do we go out on a test drive in the car, you know? Etc. Do we take his word for it or do we check it out for ourselves? I think if you have a few of these funny little grey cells that roam around, if they sort of bang into each other occasionally, it might make you realise that that might be a good idea. So maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't adopt uh, the same attitude when it comes to being presented information by Christians as fact you see the devil tries very hard to destroy the christian faith very hard indeed and if he can't drag us away from god completely well then his next best option is to deceive us into believing something that is not in accordance with the word of god gotcha ha you dumbo see paul already knew the truth of the gospel like the back of his hand the question is, do you? I've had to learn. It's taken me quite some time. Uh, but I've forced, made myself, I've, I've made a point of, of learning. I'm nobody special. I'm just another Christian. I'm not an apostle. Nobody, nobody important. The thing is, we don't have any apostles today to follow, do we? But we do have some very high-profile people who like to, I don't know, Get, your, get the money out of your pocket by televangelizing or one way or another. But, you know, we, we do have the extensive theology of at least one of the apostles. And you know where you find that? Yes, you're right. We find it in here. That's the Apostle Paul. Some other writings as well. Peter wrote some stuff. Uh, Matthew. John. They wrote some stuff to be taken notice of. Strangely, they all seem to correlate with each other in terms of what the, what, what the truth of the gospel is. Funny that, isn't it? So, all right, Paul might be sometimes different, difficult to understand. But, you know, it, that shouldn't really matter. Because with careful and, and diligent study, Christ reveals everything to us. God shows us through his word, through his teaching, and through Jesus' example. So, is it not time then, I'm going to leave you with a question, is it not time that everybody started taking notice and getting a thorough understanding of the truth of the gospel? May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
God bless till next time. See you there.